Hello and welcome to Under Pressure, a podcast for healthcare professionals focusing on the fast-paced world of trauma care. I'm Dr. Jonathan Sackier. I'm proud to be your host. Today, we've got a fantastic guest all the way from Montreal in Canada. Dr. Ed Harvey has degrees in biophysics, biomedical science, as well as medicine, and has completed multiple clinical fellowships. He's a full professor of surgery at McGill University and is the inaugural recipient of the Michal and Renata Hornstein Chair of Surgical Excellence. Ed has held several prominent positions, including serving as president of the Canadian Orthopedic Association, editor-in-chief of the Canadian Journal of Surgery, and head of basic science at the Orthopedic Trauma Association. He's conducted research on repair and recovery of the trauma patient with fundamental and clinical aspects of healing, implant, and fracture optimization, biosensors, and novel hardware. The good doctor has founded multiple companies in the sensing, biomedical, and electronic fields, and actively collaborates with basic scientists and clinicians to achieve his goals of delivering better care. Professor Harvey's work on compartment syndrome is widely and highly respected, and he's asked to speak about this topic worldwide. Because of his renown in the field, we're going to address the science behind compartment syndrome in this episode. This podcast has been supported by Maya One, a Canadian medical device manufacturer in which Professor Harvey owns stock in recognition of his inventions. And of course, it's always important uh, to make such, uh, uh, such disclosures. Please refer to the show notes for further information, and you can be in touch with us at underpressure at nextsense.com. That's underpressure at nxtsens.com to ask any questions that we shall endeavor to answer, and of course, to receive your suggestions for future episodes. So without further ado, welcome Professor Ed Harvey. Thank you so much for that uh, beautiful introduction. Uh, it's always a pleasure to come and talk about the research we've done, and uh, I'm happy to do that today. Fantastic, Ed. And uh, I have to say, as far as your introduction is concerned, I probably could have gone on for another 30 minutes. You're such an accomplished and amazing man. Uh, Ed and I had the pleasure of meeting a couple of years back, and I was immediately captivated by his ability to make perfect sense what is otherwise quite a complex situation. So, Ed, let's start at the very beginning so that we can ensure that we're all on the same page. Please define compartment syndrome and list the circumstances in which it might occur in both the acute and chronic settings. Yeah, sure. So, uh, compartment syndrome is phenomena, actually, that results when muscle swells. Muscle uh, is normally encapsulated by a fascia that allows it to do its job more efficiently. But when muscle swells, that fascia is no longer such a great aid. Uh, what happens when muscle swells is that fascia keeps the muscle encapsulated. And uh, because there's swelling in the tissue, blood flow doesn't uh, equal what is needed for metabolism. In that case, parts of the muscle and eventually the whole muscle will start to die. The s scenarios where that occurs obviously would happen after trauma, for one case, so we, that's what we started uh, this kind of uh, search for the truth was to, and the trauma patient was, was being mistreated, we thought. But it also has been, you can see it in uh, cases after revascularization, where you get what's called a reperfusion injury, muscle swelling. That'll happen after vascular injury or vascular interventions. And you can actually also see it in a chronic state where people have what has been termed shin splints in the past and cause them to stop their, their, their kind of activities and their sporting activities as you get older because uh, people say they, they can't run anymore because uh, they have pain in their legs. And it's undiagnosed, but it's actually compartment syndrome. It's called chronic exertional compartment syndrome. So those are three scenarios where definitely we recognize compartment syndrome as being a problem. So I can first of all put my hands up and say, um, damn, that's what I've got. Because <laughs> I know when you and I talked and I told you that if I go on very long hikes or I run, I, I get this problem. It can also happen after 
certain surgical procedures if we have the patient in a lithotomy position or after in patients who are being treated with extracorporeal membrane ox oxygen, ECMO basically, is, is that correct? Absolutely, ECMO has got a very high incidence of compartment syndrome, or at least compartment release at this time. Almost 50% of people have some type of compartment release. You see a lot of amputations for missed compartment syndrome in these patients. The, yeah. uh, the shin splints you complain about, yes, yeah, so a lot of people uh, just age, they call it age out from their, from their sport. They stop running. And, you, and, and but that's that might be you know we might be able to avoid that in the future. Well, I, I can't can't prevent aging out, but it does, it certainly can be very limiting. We'll have to talk more about that maybe on on another podcast. So Ed, as you know, I trained as a general surgeon, but in in Britain, when you train, you get to see anything and everything. And I remember some of my education and early practice that an acute case of compartment syndrome, this is going back a few years, right? It was diagnosed with the P's, pain, pulselessness, paresthesia, paralysis, and pallor. But these can be late signs, I believe. So tell us, as an experienced trauma and orthopedic surgeon, how useful or not are these in clinical practice? And give us an overview of what the published data show on the value of these criteria. Sure, absolutely. Uh, the P's are what's taught in med school and in residency. Uh, currently, uh, we're trying to make a change in that with, with what we're, was going on in the literature right now. It's been recognized that the P's are not as strong as we think, especially the ones like pallor, pulses, and poikiothermia, because they are seen to be more maybe of a vascular injury. So we looked at the literature as part of our process where we're, we're examining this disease and one of the most quoted papers is a, quote, a paper by Ulmer. It's a single author paper. It's uh, published a number of years ago, several decades ago. And they, they, he thought that if you got three of those Ps, you'd have a 94% chance of diagnosing compartment syndrome. So people kept it in the curriculum. That's how we diagnose it. We thought that was a little suspicious when you look at all the other data and the literature. So we went back and redid with modern literature and the same literature. And that was a paper published just last year by Larange et al. And uh, it surely shows that uh, accumulation of the P's is only good for about 21% of the time for diagnosing compartment syndrome. And even when you add pressure, it's not perfect. So that was our first clue just on retrospective review that the P's didn't work. Going forward, what we did was we uh, canvassed five level one trauma centers in the U.S., Canada, and France and looked at those P's and fasciotomies. So all patients who had fasciotomies for a provisional diagnosis of compartment syndrome, we were able to retrieve what P's they used. And that's what when it became very interesting. And that pain, which is what everyone uses, was a coin flip. It was 50-50 whether if you use pain – they got it. They had a compartment syndrome after the surgery, and the and the things that you mentioned, like poikiothermia and pallor, actually were indicative of not having compartment syndrome. So even though we were using them to indicate compartment syndrome, most patients who had those did not have it. So that was actually a negative correlation, which was very interesting to us. And and basically, at the end of all that, those classical P's really don't mean much and actually are harmful to the patient when you use them to diagnose. And I guess you've also got to think of it from the perspective, Ed, as, as a busy orthopedic surgeon, you've got someone on your service who's got, let's say, a tibial fracture, and they're on the floor. You've got to make the assessment on the ward, as we would say over here. Um, you've got to make an assessment with some degree of regularity as to whether these, if you're going by these criteria, whether they're changing. And it's, it's, it's not terribly objective, is it? It's a very... So, like, in t not only um, uh, differences be within an observer, but between observers. You may send another member of your team. Uh, what, does, what does the data tell us about that? How re reliable are human beings, even yeah. talented surgeons like you? Yeah, human beings are notoriously unreliable. It doesn't matter who you are. So any observer evaluation is wrong if you're just using a subjective score. The problem with the P's are they're very subjective. There's no way to put a grading system in, right? So, uh, I mean, we've been looking for an objective value for years. I think part of the, 
pro- scientific process that we use to come up with what we have as a conclusion about compartment syndrome didn't allow for subjectivity like that. And, you know, people in the past have looked for objectivity. I think Margaret McQueen's group in uh, Scotland were the uh, first people really to look at uh, a objective marker, biomarker for, for uh, compartment syndrome. And they had chosen pressure. We had looked at a number of other ones, partial pressure of oxygen, pH, and others in our basic science work. Uh, but people realized and have been realizing that we need something objective, just like you said. And yeah. that's, what we're, that's what we're doing with our research. Well, as, as someone who flies airplanes for a, uh, an avocation, you know, there's a little number we have, which is how much fuel we have on board. It's not something that we like some subjectivity on. It's an objective yeah. data point. So we're going to come on to those things. So thank you for that. But given these observations, Ed, why have people not studied compartment syndrome more aggressively to date? When we first met, you used a wonderful analogy to educate me. Again, I'm just a simple general surgeon. Basically, muscle as a bag of water. Talk us through that and tell, tell the audience a little bit about that analogy, because I loved it. Sure, no problem. Um, I think in the past, the only sort of objective data point people were using were, uh, was pressure. Uh, they're using a number of different techniques to measure pressure, but the concept of what they're measuring was probably inadequate in that um, the location of mu- the muscle sensor or whatever way you're using uh, depend- was uh, very location dependent. It's, a her- it's not a bag of water, it's a heterogeneous grouping of tissue Inside that, and people thought inside that was just a bag of water. You release the fascia, all the pressure is gone and, and it's treated. And the same way you diagnose it, didn't matter where you measured it, the pressure or whatever marker you used should be the same. That's not the way it really occurs. Inside that so-called bag, which is a fascial container, there's tendon, nerve, artery, different types of muscle. So you get high metabolic muscle, low bit of metabolic muscle, and depending on where you take a measurement, whether it's pressure, partial pressure of oxygen or pH, you're going to have a different value between those tissues. And they're going to respond differently to a reperfusion injury. So the concept that this bag of water exists is probably inadequate thinking. And it kind of stalled uh, the research of uh, on compartment syndrome and that we oversimplified it. And it, it's a little more complex than we thought, not unmanageable, but a little more complex than we thought. We see this often in medicine, don't we, that we have a belief system that we've all been taught and we are inertia bound as professionals, which is a good thing in many ways. We don't want to flip flop too quickly. We need sensible evidence to go from where we are to something better. But often it's a, it, it's a, a eureka moment like this. So there's basic science involved in this, Ed, and you've been, you know, you've been right at the forefront of this work. Talk us through what's new in basic science. Sure. So uh, we and other groups have been looking at solving this problem. It's a huge problem for orthopedic surgeons, at least on this side of the ocean, of the Atlantic Ocean, because uh, it's the number one medical uh, malpractice issue that we face. So people are looking at it. It's just that uh, whenever you look at something that's multifactorial and we don't really understand it, uh, there's a, we need to do a lot more background information uh, or have some more background information. And we did that. So we, we, we employed basically the scientific process. Medicine's an ob- observational science sport. It's not, a, it's not a scientific sport. So and then what I mean by that is that people do – um, like clinical observation and you, you hear about bedside to bench research and it really is focused on that. In order to do a true scientific process where you formulate hypotheses and test them and then go back and maybe redo the entire process multiple times till you get to the right hypothesis, costs a lot of money. And you were talking earlier about the, the, you know, the roadblocks to research and compartment syndrome. This is a huge part is that, we, that you need a lot of money to do this correctly. And so we were fairly successful in breaking down those 
barriers and getting money uh, invested in this uh, effort, mainly because the uh, Department of Defense in the U.S. was interested in solving it. And they have uh, fairly uh, big budgets for solving problems they think are important. So we were able to do a scientific process. And by what, what I mean by that is we did a we redid all the background research on epidemiology. Basically, we didn't know very much about epidemiology when we started. We just knew that young males got it and that everyone else was at low risk. Uh, it's a little more complicated than that. So we employed some techniques that had not been used before. We used big data analysis of the literature. That, and when you have huge data sets, you can get different uh, viewpoints out. We went back and did all the basic science over again, all the animal models. We had, I had discussed with uh, the group that was responsible for the rat model about the inadequacies of that model, and we came to the conclusion we had to redo all that. So we, we went back and redid everything. We did in vitro, in vivo, ex vivo. Uh, we did cadaver animals, cadaver humans. We did live animals. We did live rat abdomen, live rat limb. Uh, dead pig limb, dead live pig limb, and then cadaveric studies, and then on to clinical trials. And that's what you need to do in this feedback loop, kind of everything you test comes back and you start a new process over. That's scientific process. That's, that's part of the problem with why we couldn't get the answers out before is that we were depending a lot on observational science, and that, wasn't, that was inadequate really. So thank you very much for characterizing what you mean by scientific process. And again, um, what we can perhaps do is in the show notes uh, is to put some links to a literature that, that's been published by you and others on this. And you mentioned McQueen's group in, in Edinburgh, um, uh, which has been you know a good number of years and that work continues over there. Um, talk us through... So there's obviously there's the cellular level to the clinical picture, which would be very helpful. And I also want you, you, but before you did that, you mentioned that on that side of the duck pond, as it's fondly known, uh, that the compartment syndrome was a source of medical malpractice. Can you first expand on what you mean by that? Um, what, when, when do lawyers get involved with this, this rather sad situation and then leap into talking about the cellular level to the clinical picture, if you will. Okay, so science is completely unrelated to legal cases, but I just want to, <laughs> I just want to say that doesn't that's matter how much science you do, the, the lawyers won't be happy. So that's the problem, why I asked the question, Ed. That's why I asked yeah. it. Like. The, the problem on this side of the duck pond, as you say, is that uh, missed compartment syndrome, uh, whether that results in partial or complete necrosis of compartments and eventually amputation and even death, uh, unfortunately, has become a sort of uh, red flag that lawyers recognize. And uh, a number of lawsuits have, have come to fruition for the lawyers in the past, including a year and a half ago, there was a $111 million lawsuit, uh, a successful lawsuit against a physician group in Minnesota it resulted in, you know, 13 orthopedic surgeons, I think, declaring bankruptcy, if I remember correctly. And that, that sort of fear hangs over a lot of the decisions. It's really hard when you have that filter of the medical legal fear over the clinical exam, weird things happen, right? So we tend to have, make statements like, oh, I don't want data. I'm just going to cut everyone open. And that's, that's the kind of attitude has been, but the sequelae of doing fasciotomies for no purpose is large. And it's not just to the patient having large incisions and having poor outcomes. There's also a cost to society. I mean, a fasciotomy done by an orthopedic surgeon results in eight extra or, uh, sorry, hospital stay days. And if they do it done by a vascular surgeon, it results in 16 extra days. And that's a huge cost to society. And, you know, that's if you look at it from a physician standpoint, you know, the patient standpoint, we understand that's not good. Physician standpoint, would you want to do that? Would you rather be doing, you know, helpful surgery on Wednesday if you cut someone open on Saturday? So it's not just the initial surgery and what happens is also repeat surgeries are take up time that you could do more useful surgeries in. So, 
that kind of medical legal filter has resulted in that kind of practice in North America. Just totally, uh, as they say, CYA, cover your ass surgery, right? So yeah. uh, we're trying, we, we think we've come to a conclusion that we can avoid that with uh, the data we have now. So that's, that's it's avoiding misdiagnoses of compartment syndrome, one. Number two, avoiding unnecessary fasciotomies in those who didn't need them. And I should sadly tell you that, you know, um, Britain exports the BBC and, and humor and such like to America. America has exported this kind of legal practice here in the United Kingdom. Such lawsuits are happening over here as well with the same implications that, that you mentioned. So let's, let's leave the legal profession behind and let's delve back into the science, Ed. Clinical, the, the clinical picture all the way from the cellular level. Can you talk us through that, please? Yeah, sure. So uh, at the cellular level, like I said, it's not a, a bag of water in your muscle, right? So let's say there is an affected muscle group in a fascia container. Uh, let's say in the tibia, that's the most common one. <clears throat> you have a trauma. <coughs> Excuse me. You have a trauma. You uh, experience muscle swelling. So what's happening in that muscle? So what is happening is that in localized areas, there are either trauma areas or reperfusion injury areas. The reperfusion injury is the one that's kind of hard to diagnose. So, uh, you know, you can understand you'd have actual bruising in the muscle if you got, you know, a car bumper into it. But let's say you had inadequate blood flow or your muscle swelling is causing inadequate blood flow. The cellular level process that happens is that there is inadequate uh, metabolism occurring because of O2 starving, right? And that can ha that happens first in the areas of high metabolic demand. So you can even think of different compartments as being that. So the, the posterior compartment is a fast twitch muscle in the leg, and the anterior compartment's not. So the posterior compartment is pretty O2 anoxic. They don't they don't care those those uh, cells as much as the anterior compartment if there's no oxygen. So the anterior compartment often is the one that <laughs> is affected first sorry is affected first and that's why we monitor that one for a number of other reasons as well but so those high metabolic areas start uh dying and it's kind of a patchy changes so you'll have patchy biomarker changes at those levels whether it's ph or oxygen level or pressure levels and then eventually that area swells enough that it affects adjacent areas and there's multiple areas of that occurring at the cellular level in the muscle, eventually there is a almost homogeneous increase in pressure through the muscle. And that's when you really get into trouble in that the muscle is starved of oxygen globally and can no longer survive and starts to, pat, starts to die all the cells in the muscle. That can take a number of hours because it happens slowly uh, at different levels. It can take 8, 12, 18 hours to see it longer in kids even. And, uh, what we are looking for is a marker that would show us when that cellular process was progressing. And uh, we, we have reached the conclusion that pressure is better than the others for a number of reasons. I mean, pH, it's really hard to tell what pH changes occur just in that muscle or the whole body in a trauma. And that, so that's more, more than 50% of the pH changes are from outside the, outside the muscle. And if you put a pH probe inside one of those bruise areas that I told you about, it looks like the whole muscle is dead. So pH, probably not a good single indicator for that. Partial pressure of oxygen only falls after the pressure is r risen enough to choke off blood supply, right? It's, it's preserved. It's, a natural pre it's naturally preserved in the leg or else you wouldn't have a leg. Uh, so O2 changes are very late and often 12 hours behind pH pressure changes, right? So that's why in the end, at the end of the basic science research, we came to the conclusion that pressure was the earliest stable biomarker there was. Thank you very much for taking us on that, that, that journey, Ed. Um, before we get into pressure, can you tell us what are the problem points, the barriers and so on? Um, everyone thinks, oh, well, you made that observation. This is straightforward. What, what are the barriers to doing compartment syndrome research that you've experienced? Well, there's barriers for the research. I mean, in the scientific process, there's a research process where you look at the epidemiology and, and the clinical appearance, 
and then you do basic science research projects and you translate that to the population. So there's three levels of barriers, right? One of the barriers of, of, uh, for compartment syndrome is we didn't know very much about it, and I alluded to that before. The second was that we didn't know what biomarkers would be, would be important. And the third was that people were, are hard to teach. Once you're in practice and you're doing something, it's really hard to change their practice. So what are the barriers? The major barrier was um, getting enough money together to research it adequately instead of just doing piecemeal going, okay, I guess it's this biomarker, we'll do this, or I guess this happens, we'll do this, right? We had a plan from the beginning that we were going to redo all the literature. We were going to re-examine it, make sure it was true, see what new came out, and then progress with whatever, because we had a sensor lab, we were going to progress with whatever sensor made sense. And then we would take that through to a clinical translation, which is tough, and then do clinical trials, which is even tougher, and then try and translate that to a knowledge base for the uh, surgeons and other people who are affected. So those are the main barriers. I think the the big one that no one ever got over before was having enough money to do this adequately. So we, we got through that. So I think that helped us a lot. Yeah, it's always the case, isn't it, that the, it's hard to get money if it's not obvious. And if it's obvious, then you don't need the money because it's obvious. <laughs> it's exactly right. It's the challenge. Exactly right. It's true. Pressure is a biomarker, right? So another P, conveniently. So you've, you've already addressed this to some degree, right? Are there any other comments you want to make about pressure as a biomarker? Sure. We were pretty it's open. It's, it's, it's continuous pressure, right? That's what you it is. Were, we're, get, we're going to get to that. Yeah. Okay, cool. So um, it's interesting because we're pretty open-minded, and I really didn't think pressure was going to be the biomarker when we started because it was so bad that, that – you know, the the devices we're using to measure pressure, I think, were bad. It wasn't the biomarker that was bad. So in our first canvas with our big data learning where we went through and we've extracted three data sets from the, from the uh, American College of Surgeons, we had, we had millions of data points. We looked at a couple hundred thousand tibia fractures. And what was really interesting came out of it was that pressure was protective. So if patients were hypertensive, they didn't get compartment syndrome. So that was, even before we started, we said, oh, you know what? Pressure is important. So it's going to be pressure. There's going to be something about pressure we have to examine, right? So if you can get that from a clinical database, that means it's fairly significant because clinical databases, are, especially retrospective ones, are hard to pull even when you have millions of data points. So we, we got that value. That's when we said, okay, we have to test pressure. Obviously, we haven't been testing it right before. We have to make sure that it's right and there's not something else going on. So even from the beginning, it became obvious that pressure was important. Uh, so going forward, uh, we just had to make sure that we're going to, in our scientific process, pressure is going to be part of it. What, what was the last part of your question? I, I've forgotten it now. I just started well, talking. Well, you know, other reasons that you, you chose continuous pressure monitoring. Right. Well, because it's right. not just a, a point measurement, right? No, no. So there's many reasons why we chose continuous. You know, Margaret McQueen's group looked at continuous at the turn of the century. Even though it was a while ago. It was a couple decades ago. And they showed that they were earlier to diagnose it, uh, had less sequelae, and even had less non-unions in people that they added continuous pressure measurement to. If you think about it, you know, doing a static single-point pressure measurement is not not intuitively doesn't make sense. I mean, I think it, it might have been you that said it was like going to the credits, having one measurement is like going to the credits of the movie and saying you've done the whole movie, right? It's it's uh, you don't see the whole picture, and often when you put what we found when we put a measurement device in the muscle, you had a single value that was extremely high. That's because the muscle went into spasm in certain patients, right? Also, if uh, you put a pressure measurement in a normal muscular person, which we did. The pressures are higher than we accepted in the literature before. But if you had a continuous trend that was flat, obviously that was normal. Pressure trends going up almost always led to ACS. Pressure trends going down, no matter what the initial value was, did not have ACS. 
and we and now we have the clinical experience in the back end. You know, we have uh, fifteen hundred devices in actually. Uh, we've look, we can we can see what trends have done over time, and the pressure trend is what's important. Now, pressure itself actually, if you go back to that study we did with the five level one trauma centers across the world, uh, we added the P of pressure in, like palpation was it tight? And that's a that's a poor man's kind of indicator of pressure without a, without having a number. It's if it, if that compartment's tight. Now, unfortunately. People have tried to reproduce that kind of feeling of pressure uh, uh, in the in the compartments, and have been unsuccessful in 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 clinical laboratory work. So it's not perfect, and that's why we felt that a pressure trend or pressure measurement that was accurate would make more sense. Because the very act of putting a probe in um, can cause, or if someone has a pain spasm, it can momentarily go up. So. Um, what, what about unique uh, or novel tools that you've used for ACS, for acute compartment syndrome? Yeah, sure. So we have developed a device that is uh, the only one on the market uh, that w- that puts a uh, sensor inside the muscle, allows a continuous pressure trend. I mean, uh, the the uniqueness of that, you, I think... Uh, you're asking if there is an iterative versus innovative appearance to that uh, kind of a device. I think it's innovative in that we're the only device, that's the only device that gives you a trend. I mean, even McQueen's group, when you ask them how they did their continuous, they, they often did repeated sticks. The fact that this device will go in and you can go running on a treadmill with it is, uh, or go around and walk around on it and figure out if you have chronic exertional as well as having acute ex- acute compartment syndrome, is pretty innovative in itself. And there's a patient last week that was a vascular patient that uh, we were at, I was asked to see because I was in the OR doing something else, and had been revascularized, but only had two hours of downtime. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, the two hours of avascularity in a 28 year old that patient's not going to get compartment syndrome. Unfortunately, they had a block in, and I, we examined him in the resin. We said, ah, it's very soft. Like I don't think it's got compartment syndrome. Just put the device in. In the morning, the pressure started creeping up, and about three hours of increasing pressure, I just uh, phoned my partner who was on call, and I said, hey, I think this is uh, going to be important. You should go see this patient. And he just took it to the OR, and it was early muscle death in the lateral compartment that pinked up. So we were able to easily not worry about that patient. We had a good uh, objective track on that patient, see pressure going down and eventually going up. And we knew that we were getting ACS and it was proven in the OR. We did it early enough to avoid any muscle damage. So that is innovative. Like we, we, do, we did not have that ability before, that's for sure. And certainly in these days of um, demands upon the workforce on both sides of the Atlantic, in fact, in every country, there's demands on the workforce. And the time that you're going backwards and forwards to check on a patient and you you have that reassurance and you're not relying on someone else and worrying and can actually get some sleep as a surgeon is uh, uh, a reassuring development. And the fact that it speaks to mobile devices is a huge, huge advance. Um, and again, I, I had a look at it and to me it was, it, it was, you know, quite obvious. It was intuitive as to how to use the thing. Very, very straightforward. So, You've made some paradigm shifting findings. Tell us about those. There's a number of paradigm shifting findings from this whole group of literature that we've brought out. We've got about 20 papers coming out over either in press or published over the last three years. So I think that the big findings on the early kind of epidemiology uh, process where that pressure was important, that we were doing in North America four times the number of fascia armies as the diagnosis of ACS which is important. We, we knew that one in six people who had a fascia army had necrosis already, which nobody knew. So we have, we have this kind of epidemiology background now. Also cirrhosis, people with cirrhosis got ACS. We didn't know that before. So we have this kind of epidemiology, which is richer and more. It's, like I said, when I was a resident, all you knew was young males got this. Now we have a better idea of what's going on. We know that Proximal mid-shaft tibia fractures are at risk. We know that crush injuries are at risk. People on anticoagulation are at risk. 
young patients are at risk, which we knew, and we know that we're doing too many and we're doing them too late. So that, that was really interesting in that you can now explain to somebody, it is a problem. Here's the problem, right? This is the epidemiology that caused it. But then the paradigm shift now is really the P's don't matter. That pressure is the only, that trends in pressure is the only P that really matters. And that uh, we'll probably have different values for the numbers. Like we, we talk about a delta P of 30. Ross Layton's initial study, the patients got ACS versus didn't get ACS. The delta P was 40. That was important. So if we get I'm, enough patients, yeah, go ahead. I'm going to pause and say, you've mentioned delta P. I know you know what yeah. it means. I know what it means. Tell everyone else what it means. So delta P is an interesting concept. That was what McLean's concept was that, there's a critical pressure between that you could close off the blood flow to your leg. And that was a pressure that she measured by measure by taking the diastolic systemic pressure and subtracting the intercompartmental pressure. And that was called Delta P. And then if you got below 30, she used that as an indication for surgery. Now, does that mean that number is the right number? Well, no, she guessed on that number. So I think as we get more and more data with accurate pressure measurement, we might change that number. Maybe 20, it might be 40, it might be 30 still. It's close, though. It's close to 30. So delta P was important. So we have delta P, trends and pressure are important. Those are the two Ps now. All those other six Ps are gone. And that's, yeah. a, that's a paradigm shift, you know. And I think we'll have more to come because as we apply – advanced techniques like artificial intelligence to the demographics and pressure measurements, I think we're going to see, you know, whether the slope of the graph of the trend is important, whether the absolute numbers are different. So I think in the future, there's still more paradigm shift to come. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's the beauty of um, goods, uh, the application of good science to clinical medicine, which is, a willingness to accept that we might get better of this if we keep looking and to have an open mind. So bless you for that. Uh, we've hinted at what how this technology is deployed in clinical practice. Maybe you can just bullet point how if a doctor's got a, a patient that they think they want to monitor, what do they do? Uh, a to Z, A to Z, depending on which side of the Atlantic. And maybe what we can do in the show notes there's a very nice little video that shows how you put this thing in and use it. So, but maybe you can just talk us through it. Sure. I think that if a surgeon or a healthcare provider decides that a patient's at risk and does not have an obvious compartment syndrome, because obvious compartment syndromes go straight to the OR, but if they, they're at risk, so there are a number of the reasons I said before uh, from trauma, proximal mishap tibia, crush injuries on aspirin, et cetera, Obtunded patient, patients you can't really examine well, or patients that have had ECMO or revascularization for more than four hours of downtime. And now people that you want to monitor that have blocks in. So patients are worried about pain control and sore positions, so they're putting blocks in more and more patients, which makes it totally unable for us to examine. So we're using it to monitor for that. And I, we, I helped the group at the Children's Hospital put one in this weekend. So what do you do? You think, I've got a monitor. What is that? So this is just, it's actually easier than putting an IV in. You have a sterile, single-use device that comes packaged in a normal OR package. You open it. You take it out. You push one button to zero it. It's an automatic zeroing device. It, it re registers a pressure in the compartment as well as having a pressure monitor outside. So you can put the patient on an airplane or a submarine. And it was, will accommodate for that. It'll, it'll accommodate for changes in barometric pressure so that you don't have to worry if it's in for a while. That if there's a storm front comes through, you're not going to get an aberrant kind of reading that says do fasciotomy. So you just you just take it out. It has an introducer. You put this device in the muscle belly. It doesn't matter where it goes because it's relative trends. It doesn't matter if it's near the fracture or not near the fracture. It needs to be in the muscle, though. We know that if you put it in the tendon, you get high readings uh, in the tendon. So you put it in the muscle belly. It's It has a piece of uh, glue on the back of it that just sticks to the leg. You put a tagoderm over it. It's like an IV in, but it's easier because you don't have to hit the vein. You just have to hit the muscle belly. So uh, And that just goes in. You sync it to your phone. The app reads up to your phone and to whoever else on your care team. There's also a number on the device on the leg so the nurse can measure it. You can choose 
your pain point, you tell the nurse if it goes over 45, if it goes over 35, phone me, whatever, uh, if, in case you're not looking at your phone. And it's that simple, you know, it's in, then it stays in for the, for the next day, you know. Fantastic. And as I say, we'll put links in the show notes so people can see what this looks like and watch a video. Um, if someone like me can do it, anyone can do it. So, um, Ed, outside of the, the, the typical high energy trauma cases, you know, young male inebriated motorbike versus tree, tree wins. Other than that, where do you see this technology of continuous pressure monitoring being useful? And you've mentioned chronic exertional, for instance. Yeah, obviously, those that's important. I mean, they're you know the vascular world obviously is an untapped kind of uh, exploration for us going forward because it was it was designed for trauma, but they are very interested in it. Uh, the other the other thing is you have soft tissue injuries in patients that you might not want to do something on you know, for whatever reason, whether they're sick or they're uh, uninsured in the States, let's say, or, you know, the patient wants to leave or the patient wants, doesn't want a surgery. Well, you have more kind of a uh, safe haven for, for treatment in that you, you can put this in and monitor them overnight. And we've seen several cases, patients fallen down, inebriated, couldn't really examine them have a big swelling in their thigh, device goes in, pressure's high over the next six hours, goes down, discharged from the hospital. You know, and when before tense thigh might have meant going to the OR for a, for a fasciotomy, right? Yeah. That's kind of patient. I think people are using it in a number of different ways, especially now for uh, pain control. And as this feel they can block the patients and then look well, at the well, measuring device. I want to come on to that in a, in a second yeah. in more detail. But um, first of all, because the sort of linear way my brain works, we've hinted that, you know, you're a surgeon in the operating room, operating theater, and you've got a patient on the, on the ward and you're a bit concerned. This gives you the modality to check up with them. What are the implications for patients, clinicians, and healthcare systems who are utilizing continuous pressure monitoring? Sure. So the, the next three P's we're on to patients, providers, and pay, payers, you know, because those are the, the, those are the important three P's. So if you get those three, P, three P's and they're all on the win side, then your technology will be adapted. It's just an innovation uh, kind of uh, thing, you know, three P's are happy P's, you know. So uh, the patients are obviously happy in the group if they don't have the fasciotomy or if they have a timely fasciotomy, they're, they're much safer, you know, uh, going forward. The pr physicians are happy because they don't have to be, uh, they have actually an aid to diagnosis that they didn't have before. Right. So this aid kind of gives you some peace of mind. Uh, I guess if you could actually say the lawyers are, are shunned away or they're shooed away because, uh, you have actually uh, objective data to show them, right? And then the providers. So the providers are looking at not occupying those 16 extra days and actually doing total hip arthroplasty in those cases where they can make a lot of money instead of using it for a closer fasciotomy, right? Hmm. And, uh, the, and, and the decrease in medical legal suits for the, for the providers are, is important as well. So the three P's win, you know, with the device, which is any biomedical device, you have to have those three P's win if you really want it to be adopted. I agree with you. And I, I have another um, another sort of little uh, uh, means of remembering for efficiency, and it's NPDPIP. A device to be successful needs to be nurse-proof, doctor-proof, and idiot-proof. Uh -huh. The continuous pressure monitoring technology certainly meets those criteria. So talk to us about iterative versus innovative findings in acute compartment syndrome, Ed, briefly. Sure. So iterative versus innovative is a concept for all uh, device design. You could think of the car uh, as being uh, like you think the self-guided car is like totally innovative. It's actually not. It's all the way from the early Ages when you put light, you put on headlights, you put on a better brake, you self starter. It all kind of just creeped up. The innovative thing about self driving cars is that it'll change the way cities are made, right? You'll be able to like live in the country and 
commute and do your work. By the time you get to the city for your one meeting, you're on the way back in your car, right? So that's the innovative part. So what is iterative versus innovative here? We sort of uh, alluded to it. I think it actually uh, drives home the complete point about pressure. Now, that's the iterative part of this. The innovative part is the technology part where, as I said before, you have a device now that uh, is totally uh, kind of driven to the cloud, your data. You have complete records of what's going on. You have a complete trail of, of for yourself of trends of how to make a decision. You can make a decision with. So that's the innovative part of the device. So it's got both iterative and innovative uh, components. Right. So you mentioned pain. And I wanted to put you on pause because I wanted to focus on this. Uh, Ed, I've had a couple of bones broken and newsflash, it bloody hurts. It hurts. Uh, and all I wanted was to have my pain resolved. And I know that, for instance, we've mentioned fractured tibia. It's very, very painful. But analgesia is often limited, incomplete, because it might, quote, mask a developing compartment syndrome. You've already told us that pain is actually not much use as a pointer. And with continuous pressure monitoring now being available, surely we could have regional, regional anesthetic blocks applied more widely to achieve better pain control and have happier patients. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Now, it is not a uh, Maya One corporate mantra. That's the, that's the company that supplies this device, right? So... They, they supply this device to, uh, as you said, make it help with a diagnosis, aid in diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Now, we can look at the data over the last couple of years with the device where people were accidentally blocked uh, completely. But then because they had the device in, we were able to pick up when they were going towards uh, acute compartment syndrome. So I think uh, going forward, if you have that in mind uh, – yeah, having any kind of block like that patient I saw last week post-vascular surgery. We've had other patients that have been very compatible on the floor that an anesthesia went and put a block in, and we put the monitor in because we just didn't feel safe not being able to do any diagnosis, any exam uh, at all. Uh, we felt better with it in. So, yes, going forward, I think this uh, the company should pursue uh, this being used as an aid to pain relief not just diagnosis. Yeah, I mean, this is it's important to make the point this is not promotional, this is educational, this is a dis discussion between two clinicians um, and obtaining data on the validity of an approach, again, is, is good clinical science because we're in this to make the journey of patients better. So, Ed, I've asked you a lot of questions and you've been very gracious and very patient what haven't I asked you about this topic that I should have? And if I have covered everything, can you give us a sort of a pithy takeaway summary message? Sure. Uh, that's, a, that's a good ending point. I think you've really covered most of the subject. However, the, like philosophically, when you do something like this, you bring out something innovative or new that challenges the concept of what's being practiced. So practice has been that we could clinically diagnose this and we can see from the, what we've come up with that we can't, we don't do it well. Right. But if you told a physician they can't do something, they wouldn't go to work the next day. Right. So clinicians firmly believe rightly or wrongly that they can make the clinical diagnosis. And unfortunately we've had several phone calls, you know, going, Hey, how come uh, I have an amputation? You know, I thought I could clinically diagnose this. Uh, you got something that can help us. It's like, yeah, you, you know, you, trends and pressure are important. Just getting them to push over into that, which is obvious from the scientific proof, takes a big push. And, there's a, and it just takes years, you know, and, or a catastrophic event like an amputation. So I, I wish we could do this faster. It needs to happen faster, the adoption, because, like I said, we have 1,500 devices in, and, and, you know, knock on wood, the results are pretty good. Like we don't have any misdiagnosis, we don't have any amputations, we don't have any, we don't even have any unnecessary fasciotomies anymore, right? So I think the biggest message is for people who are doing innovation is it takes a long time to change opinion. 
uh, whether you're right or wrong. And uh, I just say, keep going. If you, if you have the right message, you should keep going, you know. 100% concur with you. I've had the privilege of being involved in a number of these. And it seems obvious to the innovator. And you then have to so-called cross the chasm um, and and bring people with you on the message. And, and, you know, the lovely thing about telling the truth, you don't have to remember what you said. Um, it just remains for me to thank you, Professor Ed Harvey, for being with us today, for sharing your work and for everything you have done and doubtless will continue to do for patients because I just hope I don't break any more bones. But if I do, I hope you're around. Thank you, Ed. Thank you very much. I really appreciate this opportunity. Thanks a lot. So to the audience who are listening or watching, thanks so much for taking time out of your busy day to listen and demonstrate a desire to see the best care for your patients. Please share this with your colleagues, post it on social media and Write to us with comments, questions, or suggestions for other podcasts that you'd like to see covered. And the address again is underpressure at nextsense.com, underpressure at nxtsens.com. And we'll put that uh, address in the show notes, underpressure at nextsense.com. Thanks also to Maya One for supporting this podcast. And all that remains for me, your host, Dr. Jonathan Sackius, to say please stay safe, stay well. Stay curious and remember, relieve the pressure. Bye for now.